Okay, so this is class number 14. It's the first class on Hinduism. And um, we're gonna start out with the Hindu creation stories, your reactions to the fact that there are many of them. And Hindus really don't care about the origin of the universe. They care more about the nature of the universe and the evolution of the universe. And it gradually evolved until consciousness, human consciousness is just one um, evolution of the universe. It's not separated from the universe at all. So you have a piece of the universe inside of you. That is the main um, tenet of Hinduism and getting in touch with that and living out of that. Uh, Atman Gita inside of you. That's the goal of life, is to maintain your center. Um, and also then to create positive karma rather than negative karma, right? You always have a choice because the universe has all this capacity for create creation and destruction. And so it's up to you. And the best way to do that is that whatever you do, you do it from the point of view of the jiva. Um, okay, so first thing, what did you think of the fact that the Hindus um, don't care about how you think of creation? And then they have a whole number of creation stories just so you don't fixate on any one of them. What do you think, Colin? Um, I kind of like it. Okay, good. Um, I think it's very accepting. Like, it's just weird in a sense because most religions, if you don't agree with the basis of them, it's kind of like you're thrown to the wolves in a sense that you won't like be accepting the rest of it. Actually, the three religions that are obsessed about that, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, I think the other ones really aren't. So it is good to realize that you were born into a tradition that is just one of the Abrahamic traditions. And the other ones, Confucianism, they don't care. They care about the great harmony. Hinduism doesn't care. Buddhism doesn't care. Um, so um, do you think, do you think a culture would be better off if people didn't obsess about that? Yeah, I think for the most part. Um, I think it would clear up like a lot of uh, bias going into things just due to someone being from a different religion, it would kind of end that idea, I think. Okay, prejudice, the using of religion as a weapon, and focusing more on beliefs rather than on virtues, right? I mean, what is more important if you take the Adam and Eve story literally, or if you live a good life in the eyes of God, right? Um, all right, Michael, what do you think? Um, I, I thought it was nice just because like the focus is kind of like on like a, a, an end goal, like rather than the beginning. Um, cause like, I feel like even if you do take, um, the religions whose focus is on the beginning, um, I think that usually that's really meant, what that should be meant to be is like a, a more of historical significance, the, the idea that, you know, you don't repeat history, that kind of thing, um, rather than like a fascination for a, a basis of religion, if you will. Um, and then um, I agree. I also think that it, one of the stories like that I read was like, 
it had something to do with like a flower and uh Brahm, like Brahm, I don't know how you say that. Um, and how um he split the he the flower got split into like the heaven, the earth, and something else. Um and then that like Brahm took a piece of himself and split it in two. Um, and in one way, I think that that like just creates a better like uh, equality amongst like biological sexes, like from the get go, um, compared to, for example, like the the, the Christian um, version, if you will, uh, not version because they're not really referencing it, but yeah. Yeah, in the one, in the Christian, in both of them, the man is a, a feels lonely. <laughs> And so in one, he, yeah, he splits himself. The other one is she comes from his rib. Um, but yeah, but yeah. So you can just think about how much does that affect your consciousness? For those of you who are raised Christian, how big a deal is that? This is just for you to become a lot more consciously aware of how much your worldview depends upon a certain image of creation. There are also two creation stories. You need to know that. The other one is male and female. He created them. It's not at all like the one we talk about. So that which is pretty sad. Like how come we know one of them so much better than the other one? Um, okay, Zane, what do you think? Are you talking about Lilith? What? Are you talking about the story of Lilith? Oh, um, Actually, I'm not, although that's a great story, too. You want to tell that story? Um, uh, okay. Um, well, basically, God created Lilith first before she, he created Adam. And he created Adam and told her the rules of the garden. And she started questioning him. Uh, and because she wasn't subservient to him, he, I, I forget what he does. I think he, like, cast her out. And she finds Satan first, and that becomes like Satan's wife or something. It's weird. And then um, whenever she, so instead of uh, just creating another woman, he creates a woman from Adam's rib so that the woman would be subjugated to him. <laughs> yeah, okay. Then later he created Eve. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I, I read that recently. She she gets really demonized, turned into this really wicked figure. Um, but all she was was an uppity woman, a powerful uppity woman. So um, let's see, Ryan, what did you think of that? Um, I think obviously like what you do with your whole life is more important than just like one aspect just like the origin story but I do think it's super important and I feel like it um kind of gives us the foundation of why we're here gives us a better perspective of like for example like God created us and we were in the garden of Eden and so that makes me think that maybe that's what he wanted us to be close to nature to have a peaceful life and it gives me a better perspective of possibly that's what he had intended for us. And obviously it didn't um, end up being that way, but um, I think it gives us a better perspective on kind of why we're here and maybe our purpose. And so I think it's really important, but obviously there's more important things like your relationship with the Lord, you know, that's more important than how that happened. But also if you can't really believe the origin story of a like belief then I don't know I feel like it's gonna kind of be a little hard um but I think that's if like you're in a certain religion well like for example if you're a Christian I know but if you're a Hindu does that mean you I mean does that make you somehow less in terms of a spirituality um it just depends on who you're talking to I mean, because everybody has their own perspective and somebody can think you're less spiritual just because of a certain aspect, but everybody's perspective is going to change. Like for me, I wouldn't say you're less than because it's not my place to say somebody's less spiritual or not because I don't know their relationship and what they truly feel and why they do what they do. So I wouldn't really like base 
whether they're spiritual or not solely on if they believe the origin story. Okay. Do you think some people do? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Some people are, are like that. Okay. Um, all right. Can you just say in there's confessionally, right? As a confession, I like visualizing things. I don't like thinking of God as energy. I like a visual picture, right? Sounds like it, right? You need a story. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think definitely some people need that type of idea of God to, or idea of a God uh, to be close to it. And so they don't feel like they're crazy or talking to themselves. So some people definitely need to utilize that, but then other people just uses it as, yeah, like it makes it more real. Like, and so, I mean, that's why I feel like when people say like mother nature, like they're personifying like the world. And so I feel like it's kind of similar. Yeah. Well, actually, you know, the Hindus had these two paths to God. One was God is energy and one is the path of the heart. And that's where people personify God, but they apologize for it, right? They have to apologize for making God into a person. Um, so I think, you know, you could just say I'm on the path of the heart. That's the kind of person I am. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. Um, Jordan? Um, I liked what Michael was talking about, where, like, I like the idea of there's having so many beginnings, but, like, there's one end in mind. Can you not hear me? No, not very well. How about other people? Can you hear? I can hear pretty good. Okay, go ahead. I'm I'm the old lady with the old ears, so. Okay, but I was saying, like, I really like Michael's interpretation of it. That, And I, I think there's comfort in the idea that we might have different beginnings, but we all have the same end, or kind of lack thereof of end, because I like the idea of energy being put into the universe and you're getting it back. And that makes sense to me with a lot of different things that we know about matter. Matter is neither created nor destroyed. So it makes sense that we just keep being reborn and learn more. Because like, that's what my goal is for like my existence is just to learn more and grow as a person. So I find comfort in the notion. Okay. Okay, very, who wants to respond to that? Sorry, I don't need to call on people. Um, I was just going to go ahead and comment on like kind of what I thought about it. Uh, it's kind of, kind of goes off that, uh, actually kind of after reading everything, I kind of like kind of appreciate and respect like a lot of the Hindu customs, I guess you could say. And I kind of like the idea of, you know, not really focusing on that. And I'd like the part where they kind of made all of these scenarios of how we got here because like no one would just dwell on that and they'd focus on like, uh, Shoot, lost my train of thought. But they just kind of focused on their lives ahead of them and like nature and stuff like that. And I found that interesting. Okay, good. Go ahead. Somebody who hasn't gone, you know you're going to get it in the end. I guess I'll get got now, I guess. Um, so my favorite was the like the Hindu origin story. I don't know, like the little like creation myths, little like poem, I guess you can call it. It was very, like, I've always been interested in like the great gods and noticing their origin stories. So this to me, I found interesting, uh, even as like a Christian, I found this super interesting and like how interesting, how like each detail and how everything has a meaning behind it and how is it important. Um, I do spend a lot of my life hoping that um, I end up in heaven, like, as, as a Christian. Sorry, someone dropped their suitcase. Um, but I've, like, I respect it more after I read it, and, like, reading all the other stories and articles, I've just learned to respect it more and understand it more, and That's I don't think that cute. harms to anything. That's nice, Alexis. I appreciate that, even though it's different, right? Yeah, okay. I feel like learning about it doesn't make me any more less of a Christian. I think learning about other people and other people's cultures and people's religion 
is a way of getting to know the world and seeing the world through a wider scope. Okay. Yeah, well, actually, we're going to do Gandhi tomorrow, and that that's about that, that he tried to be Western, and then he, by separating himself, he came back to Hinduism and appreciated it a lot more than when he originally, you know, just grown up with it. <clears throat> and he also told Christians that they should try it. It's actually a good religion. <laughs> You know, because when you grow up with it, with habits as a child, sometimes you really don't necessarily get the point. Being a Christian is doing what your parents told you or something like that. And it's mm -hmm. actually deeper. Does that make sense? I, yeah, it does. I think I was lucky uh, growing up because my mom never forced religion onto us, but she was open for us to learning it and wanted us to see that, it, like to understand faith, but she never forced Okay. okay, Tim, what about you? What was the question? Well, creation stories. That was the first thing. What did you think about the fact that they have a lot of different creation stories and they don't really care how you think about creation? Um, I mean, um, it, 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 I'm not saying they should care because the story is the story, but at the same time, like, I should care a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> you tell me, I want to get my feedback and let you know what I think. But instead of that, I mean, I mean, I didn't really have no thought to it because, I mean, there it is what it is. I, I didn't really have no thought to it as much. I can't really write as much for that one. Okay, it's just sort of imagining. Imagine yeah. what it would be like to be in a tradition where they, you know, one day your dad will read or your mom will read one creation story and the next day or the next week, they'll read another one. And yeah. what do you think that would be like? Would it make a difference? I don't think it would make a, well, I don't really think it would make a difference, but I mean, I don't know. I don't think it would make a difference, honestly, though. Okay. This is me. All right. Alyssa? Um, I thought it was really interesting and everything because, um, like, I appreciate how, like, they don't really care uh, about, like, which creation story you believe. But obviously, like, I've grown up Christian. And, like, to me, I feel like where you began is so formative to, like, your worldview. And so, like, them having such, like, loose thoughts around it I think in a way like broadens their horizons more than like so like I'm not trying to like say that like Christians are like close-minded but you know we like with the rib story like we're taught though uh like women were supposed to stand by man and we're there in support but then uh you know like Hindus aren't taught that and so I just thought that was like really interesting because like I do think creation is so like influential on your worldview can you imagine what it'd be like if you were a Hindu? Yeah, I kind of like can't imagine it because okay. like, I feel like my church, like we put such an emphasis on where we started. So I don't know. Okay, well, it's good to know that, right? You learn about yourself. Um, and then you learn about, well, how do you use that story? Do you use it just as a way to focus your own actually is a foundation for your own virtue or some people would use it as a weapon you know to distinguish between us and them so that's that's kind of the main thing um all right so that was the first point i wanted to bring up was creation how about did you like that copulation theory of creation <laughs> okay she turns into a uh, cow he turns it into a bull and he copulates and then blah blah and so the whole thing is male orgasms that i don't like that one too much <laughs> right what what do you guys hey guys do you think that's a pretty cool creation story no <laughs> okay 
You don't think so, Michael? Why not? Well, again, I feel like that just leads to like, un just from the get go, an uneven like playing field. I would imagine it was a man who wrote the story, huh? Yeah. Okay. Um, but I mean, just FYI, you can also be a Christian and just say, I prefer the other, the second creation story. So I don't, I don't believe in the Adam and Eve story because you can't believe in both. Um, so anyway, that's an FYI. It is amazing though, how much the culture absorbs just certain parts of a tradition and how much emphasis they get. Um, so that is important for you to step back and think a little bit about that. Um, okay, so let's go to the screen share. What are the, what is the, what are the two stories? Oh, well, the second one um, is much more, it actually is more about the phases. First there was light, let, let there be light and then there you know, remember that and he separated the light from the darkness and then there was so all of that stuff is a different story it's actually in a different verse and then all it says is male and female he created them so when you think about it probably in your mind you sort of remember that part of that story and then you remember the adam and eve story right and you sure. sort of glue them together but that's not, you know, the way it is in the in the Bible. Um, okay, so let me see. Ma'am. Yeah. I did learn something new about the Adam and Eve story. Okay. So I learned that, like, so there was like, as you were like, are told the Adam and Eve story. There are two trees. One of um, knowing the right and wrong and then knowing the um and then it was like so basically the trees were symbolizing two ways like the two necessary items to become a god okay and um so the first tree was knowing right and wrong and then the second tree was immortality and so there i was re i was listening to a podcast talk about it and it was saying if adam and eve had gotten to the like if the devil had tricked adam and eve into thinking uh, to take in the other tree, we would be immortal, but no sense of right and wrong. So it's kind of like a, like, which one would you choose if you had to choose between the two trees? Right. Okay. So I that. mean, there's a lot of scholarship on the Adam and Eve story. And one of, first of all, people who wrote myths didn't think they were historical facts. That's an insult because anybody can write a historical fact. It doesn't take any wisdom. So if you're wise, you write a story that's about a pattern and that's, you're a poet. So that's just the way that was at that time. That's the way they thought. It's only the modern world that values facts first and foremost. Um, so anyway, let's see. They're the interpretations of Adam and Eve. So, um, oh, there's there were six of them in the, I used to teach in the women's issues class, but the ones that stick out the most to me were um, that it's about heightened self-conscious awareness. So during the process of evolution, at a certain point, people become aware of their power of choice because their consciousness is complex enough. So societies become complex. The brain is responding, right? And it's growing in response to the world. And, and our capacity to understand the world, to recognize patterns was what made us successful, what made us fit. So we would figure out one pattern and then we would adapt, you know, figure out how to survive better because of that. And then another one, another one. Pretty soon we got aware enough that it occurred to us that we have a choice. We could actually choose this or choose that. 
and and so that you could say the Adam and Eve story is just about the uh, emergence of consciousness. And Hinduism is also just about, it believes that consciousness emerges from the evolutionary process. Um, so then another version of it that I'm aware of is that the snake was a symbol for goddess worship. And so for what, almost 30,000 years, 25 plus thousand years, the cultures were focused on the goddess and not necessarily worshiping the goddess, but living with the goddess, right? The earth is the goddess and you live with the goddess and you get, stay in touch and you have herbal remedies and you, you just stay in touch with the goddess. And the snake was her symbol because the snake sheds its skin and grows a new skin every year. So it's just like the dying and re rebirth in the natural cycle. So when the Adam and Eve story, the snake is the bad guy, right? And he tempts uh, uh, Eve. And so it's really about the overthrow of matriarchy a goddess-centered culture by patriarchy, because now you have a male god who um, who asks Adam to control the earth in his name, right? And it's uh, authoritarian. It's much more authoritarian, much more patriarchal. So that that that's the one that I think is the best interpretation, because a lot of other that's a lot of old symbolism, uh, for better or worse. I mean, you can think about it however you want, but um, that's the context of the ancient times when it was written. Okay, so um, Hindu creation, and then okay, yeah, all right, we there. The other issue I wanted to point out is that scholars disagree on what creation is. And um, there are books written about this, you know, and scholars do a lot of research on all this stuff. And so um, is God, okay. All right, so each of you could clock into this. Clock in what you think. Do you think there was a big bang or no? Do you think the big bang um, was caused by God? Or do you think it just happened? It was a switch from potential to actual. What were the original conditions? And this is where people disagree. Like some people think the universe is one big accident and life is meaningless. There's no inherent meaning in it. Um, but it is important to know that at one extreme, there's a very particular meaning that, that there's a certain Judeo-Christian and actually Islam, uh, Muhammad claimed to be part of that tradition. So the Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition uh, interprets the entire existence of the universe as planned by this God who was the God of Abraham. And then this God has a plan for history and in, intervenes in history, but is focused on the sons of Abraham and then people who convert to the religions related to the sons of Abraham. That's one interpretation. Another, and that's a very orthodox word-based and it's discriminatory, right? It's exclusive. Then there's another one that says everything's meaningless and accidental. Then there's the, the views, spiritual humanism, that evolutionarily, it's clear that our nature is to understand and also to live sustainably at this point in history. But you could also think of God as a clockmaker who wound it up and let it go and now stays out of it. God sort of structured the original conditions and now it just goes in this ordered way. Um, okay, God is the cause once begun, it's self-regulating. God sustains it, 
God is, is the universe, keeps changing with the universe. And what is our relationship to God? Um, is God impersonal? We just stay in touch with the jipa, or God is personal, or do you apologize for personifying God, or do you uh, believe God intervenes in human history? Um, and, and honest to goodness, I've changed my mind over the years, so there's no reason why I would actually have, be invested in you coming up with one or the other um, experience and a whole lot of other stuff. Um, God and environmental problems. Given, and I, I do want to ask you, given your view of the origin story, how does that affect your attitude about environmental problems, about what we, whether we should pay attention to them, how much we should pay attention to them, and why we should pay attention to them. Um, and that's true. I mean, for people who think the whole thing is meaningless, you also have to answer. They also have to answer that question. For people who think it's Judeo-Christian God's plan, um, for people to think it might be Judeo-Christian, but the plan wasn't to destroy nature, or people who think it's um, product of evolution and we are definitely sp not supposed to be creating bad karma. So for a Hindu, it's like, this is bad karma. This is not at all consistent with Hinduism. Um, all right. So um, everybody, give a first reaction. I says, this is gonna be one of those quick rounds. Um, Colin, oh, Tim, go ahead, Tim, yes. And then you guys just jump in. I don't wanna to take too much time on this. Jump in, Tim. Okay, so so if there was a big bang, I think there was, because science, like, it has evidence to prove all everything. Now, I'm not saying I don't believe in the God and stuff like that, but, that's a belief. There's no actual like evidence to to say that. You know what I'm saying? So I do like stuff in the Bible is true and all that. But when you have science, I I, I rather believe science than I believe um, the acts of God and all the other stuff because, like I said, it outweighs it with evidence. That's right. like. To, hum to human eyes and clearly see. But, well, the belief in God can be an interpretation of the meaning of the evidence, right? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So one of my students said belief is accepting without evidence. And that's what you're saying, right? You don't in a way, to... yes. Well, I, yeah, in a way. Okay. I mean, there's evidence of the Big Bang. So you do accept that. But the belief part is whether you think there's a God that caused the Big Bang or not. Does that make sense? Yes. And then you do have evidence that there's a Big Bang, but the claim that there's an underlying God that causes it, that's the belief, but it doesn't contradict science. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Is that really what you want to say? I mean, I mean, kind of. I, I, in, in reality, I just want to say, like, I rather believe science than I believe, uh, like, a religion or something like that. Okay. Like I said, science can back it up more. Go ahead, Alexis. I honestly agree with him. A lot of my middle school, early high school life, I wholeheartedly believed science and I was a super science nerd because there was proof there was evidence and, and like scientifically like you can see it like there's no oh well this happened and then this happened and who do you believe you believe a white man who wrote the book like um growing up my pastor he sat me down and he was like so why do you believe in science and not um um not the bible and I wholeheartedly looked at this man. Mind you, this man's like 36, 37, white, born in Warner Robins, Georgia, has not left the city his entire life besides to go for like church visits and stuff. I looked him dead in the eye and I said, because like over 
how many years ago a white man sat down and wrote it you know Alexa, he was like huh it was because I, I didn't didn't like how like it was someone wrote it it wasn't like it randomly showed up I just wanted to say I admire my my students at Lion a lot more than I admire myself because a lot of them have courage right they had to think oh, yeah. outside of the box where I'm, you know, I claim to be this broad thinker, but my parents wanted me to be that. So I'm not really, I don't have that kind of courage that you have my, my students do. Okay. My mom has always taught me that I should always have the confidence to speak my mind. And if I'm afraid to speak my mind, my, my, my viewpoint is not important. So here she is literally in the middle of the airport talking as loud as I can be about like some controversial topic and I'm like we're gonna get jumped but <laughs> <laughs> I've always like like going back someone had to write the bible and that didn't sit well with me like <laughs> it wasn't God sat down and wrote the bible and it's history it was someone sat down and was like here you go here's here's the bible and it's like it didn't sit right with my my mind, so that I think that's why for the longest time I was like science wholeheartedly. So I hundred percent agree with Tim. Well, Let's going go. off what you were talking about, Alexis, I was in a summer program and I had the same exact thought. They were talking about the idea that God is not fallible, but uh, but uh, but people always are, and I was like, well, then isn't like the Bible not correct because people are fallible and they can't actually hear his word and they're interpreting and it's most likely interpreted incorrectly because he's perfect and they're not. So they were just like, well, well, you know, God wrote it through them. So maybe it was correct then. I was like, but if people are in fact, like you're not making sense here. I, I, <laughs> That's like, what I'm saying. I like the idea of science more because to me, a lot of religion is about moral desserts it's about doing something just to get somewhere else. I don't like the idea of me living this life as a trial run for either forever hell or forever heaven. That's not a comforting idea for me. I like the idea that like we get to keep going and like learning more, but I don't know. I mean, if y'all believe in religion and stuff, to me that's frightening thinking that you could go to hell forever simply because you weren't like the perfect being. I don't know, it's weird. Remember when we talked about the relation between gods and men as one of slavery and blind obedience, right? That's or, another thing. I don't obey anyone. I barely obey my mom. I, that's, that's another thing I can't do. Go ahead, Ryan. Oh, I was going to say in terms of what you were saying, like relationship, I said like back when we first started this class, like I view my relationship with God as a friendship slash dad to daughter type of relationship okay. slash like 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 I said best friend and like I'll be driving and I'm like just talking to God as if like he's my friend and that's just how like I find comfort and as to what like Jordan was saying like right now I'm on my quest like my spiritual journey to read the bible for myself so for me that was something that held me back from religion was the fact of like hell like I don't believe that there's like eternal hell there's no escape like I don't believe that if somebody had 20 years on this earth and decides not to like believe in God you go to hell but as reading through the bible like there's so many things that God asks of us and then like so many things like like the promise of love and like the promise of like eternity like I feel like it's not just whether you believe or not. Like, I feel like it's super complex because he asks of so many things. And so I feel like it's like kind of like, a, like he'll weigh it and be like, you did all of this good. Like not one thing is going to say you go to hell. And that's how I have like comfort in it. But when you guys talked about like, um, like somebody else writing the Bible. So I get now, now rereading or not rereading. I only read like quotes, but now I'm actually like reading the New Testament. So each book, each uh, book is somebody else's interpretation of what had happened. So you can kind of think of it as like a murder, right? And there's like this many people looking at the murder and they're giving all of these different perspectives and you read it and there's like, some things differ. Like when like Jesus was about to get turned in 
to get crucified, the dialogue was a little different. And that's something that I noticed. But um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it was written, not Jesus didn't like write it. He did it through people. But then that's why it's faith, right? Like to trust it. And that's somebody else's personal opinion, whether you want to trust it or not, or if you want to even believe in it or not. But I, I choose to just go in with an open mind and just, um, you know, see for it for myself when I read it through like my own perspective. See, like, I, I get what you're talking about. Cause like being Jewish ethnically, Jewish people don't believe in a hell. They believe that this is hell, like where we are now. And when we die, if we don't quite believe in God or we're not worthy of him, we spend time in purgatory until we are. I think that's way more comfortable than that, like what you're talking about. You don't believe it. Like, yeah, I would love to say that. But if you just read the Bible, that's not what they say. And I feel like a lot of the information is contradictory. But I think it's also what you're talking about, which is like interpretation and faith. And like what Alexis was talking about earlier, a white man wrote down the King James Bible version. That is not the original. Like, if you want to, like, go back and reinterpret some of the things from the original Hebrew, a lot of the messages that people get from different, different passages is very different. So, I, like, I do get what you're saying, but, like, as an agnostic person, it's really hard for me to come to terms with the idea of what God is represented in a book and what people actually feel about him. Um, funny story, whenever I think of when I, when I, when I said that, I think of that, like, TV or that movie where... A guy comes in and goes, where's all the kids? And the girl goes, a white man came and took them. And the guy goes, a white man? No! I think, I think that's, I, I immediately think of that. And that's just like, I thought I'd share it because it got really serious. And I'm, I feel like I'm the comic relief. Does anybody, so else, anybody else want to comment before we move on? I wanted to say that I thought it was kind of like, God was like a clockwork person. Like he just kind of spun it up and let it go. Possibly okay. you could have created the Big Bang, but you can never prove that there was a Big Bang or what it could do. You can only theorize. You can't, to prove something that exists, you have to be able to do it again. That's the basic science behind it. That's how laws and things like that happen in science. So, so you, just, you sort of see the creation as a clock because you see how it all fits together yeah like there might have been a big bang there probably was a big bang it can't happen again and who knows what started the big bang we don't have the knowledge to know or possibly ever have knowledge to know okay do you think do you think there's a God is a mind that set up the original conditions and then, you know, designed the clock? Yeah, then... I kind of see it as like a Newton's cradle. So there's this guy, he just like bangs two balls together and just lets it go and see what happens. I don't think that he's intervening or okay. anything like that. Do you think the universe is self-organizing though? As it does move forward, things relate to other things and they, they organize, you know, what, what survives is what can adapt to what's already there. So it is kind of self-organizing. Does that make sense? Yes, I do. I really do believe in that. Like the earth will go through its cycle again to get to its best fit for itself. Like the planet, my opinion, is alive and will do what's best for them. Right. It doesn't care about humans being quote unquote yeah. parasites on it. Yeah. If we get to four degrees uh, higher, we're going to, the earth will be able to carry a billion people. So, you know, six and a half billion will die off, but it'll be trying to adjust and adapt to the situation. Right. Does that make sense, Colin? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Michael? Um, I was going to say that kind of reminds me of, um, I, I think it was a comment from one of like the Newland readings that was like uh, something about how like uh, God could create a universe that could like create itself. It was something along those lines. Yeah, that was the first one, Biology of the Spirit. Yeah, um, and that, that reminded me of that. Um, he said it could have a God, it doesn't need a God. 
Um, but as far as like what I think about like the beginning, um, I don't know, actually. Um, I don't think that, I definitely don't think of creation in, in, in the aspect of like, Adam and Eve, like I don't, I don't believe that that was how like life first first began. Um, but also, I think that there's like a lot of like there is historical significance of things that happened in the Bible. Like there are things that happened in the Bible that historically did happen. Um, but um, there are also things that are questionable. You right, know? and that's the way Greek tragedy. That's what Aristotle says. You take historical figures, historical events, but then you mythologize them, which means you. So you I'm really sorry to interrupt, but my plane was just changed gate. So I'm going to move and try to come back. Okay. All right. So Tim and Alyssa and Zane, anybody want to clock in once more before we move on? Okay, anybody? All right, so we'll go to the next one, but we'll start with you, the three of you. Um, but anyway, I do think it's important for everybody to take a step back once in their life and spend maybe 20 minutes thinking about how problematic that is and how much of a deal it is to so many people. Um, all right, so. This is the idea of cultural selection that every human being who's ever lived has to deal with what's going on inside of them, with their relationships to other people and their relationship to nature. But cultures select for, they sort of specialize in different things. So India specialized in turning inward and Confucius specialized in relationships. And the, and the West has specialized in understanding nature and trying to build a whole culture based on our idea of nature. And so we were the society that had the scientific revolution, industrial revolution, whatever, but we're also the society that's number one in destroying the earth. Uh, so I think we took it, uh, took it too far, but anyway, so, that's similarity and difference. We can understand these other cultures well knowing that we didn't grow up within it, but definitely you can blow your mind, right? You can convert, you can look at the world in a different way. And everything related to this class is how do you want to convert, right? Uh, what is the foundation you want to start from based on, so far, based on what you've learned? So um, this is what I did on the video. I went through this. So let me go here that everybody wants infinite joy, infinite knowledge, and infinite, let's see. Oh, oh my goodness. How could I do that? Infinite being, right? And how do you get it, right? Um, the key is for a Hindu. So you're on those paths of pleasure, of success, of duty, and then you go, what else is there in life? I've run myself ragged, you know, worrying about my own pleasures or pleasing other people, um, serving other people. And now I want to find something deeper in life. And this is how you do it. You learn that meditation technique. You learn how to go inside and stay in touch with the jiva. And then you always have joy, knowledge, and being because you know, you know, you see everything from a cosmic point of view. Um, and then everybody incorporates, every Hindu should incorporate all four paths and balance them out. Just like the Greek gods, you have to balance it all out. So everyone should meditate, everyone has to engage in action, and then the two main differences are reflection, God is impersonal, I think of God as energy, and then God is personal, so you create a relationship. Um, 
then the main the point of these ancient traditions is linking culture and nature. Max Muller says that um, under Confucius, I said in in relation to human relationships, Confucius is radically different than Western individualism, and our founding fathers liked Confucianism, the Analects, for that reason. But Muller is also saying the Hindus provide an antidote to what annoys, you know, what's out of balance in the West is that we don't focus enough on our inner life. Um, all right. So how many of you have had a conversion experience? I promised you that I would call on you on this, on the tape. Um, all right, everybody has to clock in. Have you had some kind of conversion? It can be intellectual conversion, it can be scientific, just something where you went from a childhood point of view to where the point of view that you're at now, or there can be more than one. I mean, there's lots of different ways to go. So Colin, what about you? Um, Does like, a culture change kind of count i mean like orlando's kind of the south kind of not the south like it's the mixture so coming from like florida to arkansas was like a big change for me it is it was for me too i came from minnesota but yeah and then you understand how powerful culture is does that make sense colin yes ma'am but that means you should give it up. I mean, if you really want a deeper truth, nothing is true because that's how you were raised, right? Uh, so it, and that's not easy to kind of flush all that stuff out, but that's what liberal arts, that's why we try to get students from as far away, you know. Um, okay, Michael, what do you think? Um, um, I don't know. Okay, it could be there. You could take a physics class and all of a sudden see the world through the lens of quant. You know, everything is quanta or something like that, right? Right. You could, you could yeah. There's just so many different ways that the light of your mind, right? The way your mind sheds light on what's outside of you is different from what it was when you were a kid. Right. Um, can you come back? Sure, of course. You can pass. Everybody can pass, which just means I'll catch you later. <laughs> uh, Ryan? So, um, sorry, what was the question? I know we're talking about like culture, but what specific well, a conversion turning around so you started out in childhood seeing the world one way then maybe you know it can be anything you take a physics class and everything in the world is quanta or you take a environmental biology class and everything in the world is uh the integration of culture and nature or you take uh you know all of a sudden you see the world totally differently through a different lens so did you have an experience like that? Yeah, um, definitely coming from Hawaii and then going to Batesville, Arkansas. Um, yeah. I'm like, what the heck? It was crazy. I mean, just the culture, the way people talk to each other, the way people interact with each other, the mindset is just so completely different. Like, And um, I feel like it is important to go into different cultures and to be open-minded with that culture, but not forsake the culture you're in. So I take my college experience on the mainland for what it is, and it's so important. That's why I think there should be a huge push for Native Hawaiians to go out into the mainland and understand that there's so much more, um, but also to keep the values. Uh, so the high school that I went to, uh, you have to be Native Hawaiian to, be, to that, uh, be in that school. And so the Hawaiian culture really focuses on the connection to earth, to the earth to man, and they provide, but you don't own land. Like you don't really own the land, it provides for you. And so 
using the moon and the stars to calculate when you harvest and um, things like that and just very community community based um, lifestyle um, is something that's really important and um, you know I think it's something to, that I'm going to take with me throughout my life but it was a culture shock to be like outside of Hawaii and even though I traveled to like California all the time like all the way since eighth grade been there for on and off on and off on and off for soccer it's not the same like LA is not the same as baseball Arkansas and so it's just completely different and so that was a culture shock yeah I would say that um to a philosopher going to a new culture is the equivalent of a scientist going to their lab right it's your lab like you're looking at how it all fits together I would also ask you don't you think this would be an uh, an advertisement for why small liberal arts colleges are important because they really try to pull kids away from habit and custom and just get them to re-examine and be aware. Does that make sense, Ryan? Yeah, so it isn't just Hawaiians. It's like, I just feel bad that Northerners and Southerners do not interact that much. It's really sad. Uh, for grad school, our students don't go north because even if they can get in, they have to pay the outstate fee. And that's, there's no reason they can pay one fourth as much if they stay in a southern state. So that that's just really unfortunate because it just means we're not going to be able to all, you know, when we vote for Congress or president, we're just, we're not communicating with each other. Does that make sense, Ryan? Yeah. Um, Jordan, have you had this turning around? Did you realize how much being Jewish, how different that made you? Or, I, I mean, no, whatever. Uh, that was what I was going to go for. Oh, no, go okay. ahead. Do what you were going to go for. Um, I just remember this moment when I was 12 and being in a crowd of people and taking like a step back from being like in my life and I started thinking that each of these people are a person that I don't know that have just as intricate lives that I have that I will never know and it really put in perspective where I am in this world and how I'm connected to other people um and that's one of the things I wrote about to get into this college or in the honors program is uh it's it's a sensation called sonder but it's this idea that you realize that you are just one soul of many and that your life is just as complicated as the person next to you but they're never going to know it and it's not it's the idea that no one's an npc or like <laughs> the idea that everyone has isn't just this player character that's featuring in your world but like they actually have problems and things that you can relate to, but they're different than you completely. Uh, it changed me a lot and made me more of a emotionally intelligent person. I, I think that the book 1984, did you ever read that? It's kind of a ninth grader, you know, consciousness of being an outsider kind of book, I think um but anyway uh, we read animal farm we didn't read, read that either. one i read both because i just really liked animal farm a lot and i with 1984 i don't know i'm really paranoid about the government anyway so the idea that they limit literature like nazi germany is just a lot like what you're talking about me as a jewish person i don't know it was always kind of conscious people always make <laughs> comments like what are you a jew <laughs> Yeah, no, that was a big thing because I was the only Jewish person my entire high school, elementary school, all that. I got those comments as well. Yeah, <laughs> it was just like, it was always put in a negative and I was like, yeah, I am. And like, just like, what are you going to say about it? And Actually, they never had a response, okay. so I never felt bad about it. The only reason I asked you that, Jordan, is because you have referred to it before. Right? No, I'm not taking offense to it. I'm just like, okay. it, it's not like it wasn't a turning point for me I'm just like yeah I'm a queer woman who is Jewish it was never like oh my mindset's completely different now that I think about <laughs> it from the Jew perspective like it was never like that 
Okay. Well, that's good. That's a natural, again, that's like the Adam and Eve story, just this heightened self-conscious awareness that's developmental. It's just that it happened evolutionarily because society's got complex enough. Does that make sense, Jordan? Okay. Uh, Tim? I would say uh, my conversion would be when I transferred to uh, high schools. At first, I went to a uh, school called Armwood. It's like a predominantly black school, very known for the football team, a whole bunch of five stars, all that. And like, and then when I transferred, we lost state, so I ended up transferring to a school called Tampa Catholic. And I was more predominantly white. That was a different part of Tampa. And it was just such a conversion because the, the the people in the school, especially when it comes to like being around a whole bunch of black kids all my life and then going straight to a school, a whole bunch of white kids, you see everything way different. You gotta like, you gotta adapt to their society. And I see it on TV all the time, but I don't really know how they act because I don't be around them as much. But now that I was, it kind of op opened up another perspective for me because I only had one perspective. When I was around a lot of black people, we just, I don't know, did whatever. But around a different type of person, kind of got to, you know, act accordingly, especially at a private school. So, yeah, and then also, like, the football was kind of different, too. Since I played at um, the other school first, it's like, since a whole bunch of five stars were there, better competition. So, the version there would be, Less competition, but still good, but it's kind of different. Okay. That would be more confusion. Like it's all based on relationships. But yeah. that's that's interesting. Um, Alexis. So I was running on the way here and I didn't care the question. Oh, that's okay. A conversion experience. I'll go ahead with Elisa and J um Zane. It's just, did you turn around from seeing the world one way to another way? Oh, I can answer that. Um, okay. So um, growing up in Germany and traveling around the world, it did affect my mindset, my worldview, and then coming to America to stay for my, like, my growing up process. And if I can definitely tell that like my seeing myself one way and seeing myself a different way, if I continue to stay in Germany and how I am now. So I would say my viewpoint has changed greatly, but nothing um, nothing like groundbreaking, just the small details add up to something more. Okay. And that's again, relationship stuff, a culture, ad adaptation. Okay, Alista. Um, I feel like I've had a few, but I remember like the most prominent one I ever had. Um, you know, I grew up playing softball and like for a long time I was on teams from like my area of Houston, but then in high school I joined this one that was from like a very rich suburb of Houston and I was the only one that came from like a middle lower middle class home and I lived all the way out in the middle of nowhere and just like the way all of my like teammates and their parents like interacted with like just the places we would go and like interacted like wait staff. I remember like, like not necessarily that they're bad people, but I was just like, we live completely different lives. And like specifically, I remember we were at a camp for a college and my friend was uh, on the team it was like, oh, well, I know I'll get in here. My grandfather has like a name has like a building named after him here. And I was like, my grandpa didn't go to kindergarten like because he grew up in Mexico and I was I will never forget her saying that I was like we have completely different lives like they're not bad people but it's just a whole different mindset yeah money is a corrupting influence I think everybody needs to have about the same amount if you're gonna have you know understand each other's humanity but okay Zane what do you think Oh, uh, well, I mean, I don't know if mine's much of a conversion experience, but uh, kind of like the cultural shock and stuff like that. And it's kind of like interesting because you talked about like how it's unfortunate of how like people from the South and the North, they don't really get the opportunity to speak that much. And how, I mean, it's hard for me to explain, but it's just different in how like they do stuff. But 
I me, mean, I was born and raised in Arkansas. I mean, I still live here, but like from the time I was in probably third grade up until my senior high, till I was about 11th grade, every summer I would go with my dad to Iowa during farming season. Well, like it's just like when I went up there, even though it's just a state between us, just the way stuff is done and like how like the phrases they use, like for like example, like what we call soda in Arkansas, like they call pop. And like somebody say that, be like, what the hell are they talking about? But anyways, like it was just like those different like experiences and stuff like that. And like the experiences I had up there, I can say like I probably wouldn't be like the same person I am today without those experiences and like getting to see their customs and stuff like that. So, yeah. Okay. So we are very adaptive and adaptable creatures, um, sometimes for the good and sometimes not so good. Anyway, so lots of different kinds of conversions. Some of them are intellectual. Some of them are cultural. And then in India, be emotional. Like you turn around. So your inner life totally changes because you get in touch with the Atman. So uh, in India, it's, you go from a little kid that just reacts to the outside world to somebody that's in touch with the deeper consciousness and everything you do sort of emanates from that. That would be a Hindu kind of conversion. Um, and then the psychology piece is that we're going back to that issue with um, Esther Sternberg and stress and the way Western society keeps playing to the brain in a way that increases stress. Go ahead, Michael. Oh, I was just going to talk for uh, the what we were just talking yeah, about. Yeah, conversion, I forgot. Go yes. ahead. Um, uh, and this is kind of trivial, um, but like, uh, so like last summer, uh, I'm also from Arkansas and, uh, and I've been here the whole time, but last summer um, I got like a research internship in Washington, D.C. And I remember like, uh, like going to the grocery store the first time, um, the plastic, like the Walmart bags cost money. Like they, it's like it costs you five cents a bag to use them. And I was like, I'm absolutely not going to pay for these bags. And like the very first time I went shopping, I literally just carried my things out in my in my hands, you know. Um, but then after that, I uh, I got um, like reusable shopping bags because that's what everyone there does. Um, and so it was really just like uh, to see the difference in like uh, just something that is so uh, it's so like trivial and so small, but also like the fact that you do have to pay for for those bags like that keeps people from buying them um, and in turn like less plastic yada yada um, but kind of just to see like like uh, imagining that in Arkansas like it, it wouldn't work people would lose their minds they would um, and uh, so it was just interesting it was interesting to draw like uh, draw conclusions um, up there versus here and, and whatnot it also points out how much of religious traditions are physical. You have to meditate or you have to pray five times, something physical, something with your body, because you can believe just about anything, but if you don't have to do something, you know, it, you have to register it with your body. So Confucianism, you have to bow, all this stuff. And um, that's important because your body doesn't like change. That's why trying to mold people, remold people to live sustainably is going to be a huge problem. Right, Michael? Because they aren't going to want to. <laughs> and well, on that on that same on that same hand, like, I mean, obviously I didn't want to pay for these bags, but like it is a very, very like cheap cheap amount but like it was something that was so small it kept me from doing it you know so like I, I don't necessarily think that it, it that it would be that difficult per se um but what if somebody be... told you you needed to get your windows um you need to get better windows so they don't leak so that you don't spend so much energy on heat and air conditioning what what if you have to get different windows or you have to get solar panels or 
and even then, you know, the government is going to pay for this stuff, but people still don't do it. Right. So, right. Yeah, I recognize that it's much larger than that. But at the same time, that something that is so small and insignificant can make uh, like a difference. And I, I doubt that those bags actually really cost five cents to make. I imagine that they go ahead and use the five cents per bag for other useful things. Right. It's like a tax. Um, all right. So we are going to read some articles about uh, Hindu meditation, mysticism, and how it actually does stimulate the brain in a way that maintains, um, that avoids stress, just like Hester Sternberg went to the Greeks to find those techniques. But uh, Hindu and Buddhist, really, that's their specialty. Uh, what is stress? Do you think it's a, it's a socially constructed problem? Do you think it's a serious problem? Do you experience is part of the cause that the society tells you who you are is how successful you are. And yet you can't control that all the time. I mean, you can't control how people perceive you at some point. You can't control if you get straight A's or if you're... So if your identity is caught up in external achievements, does that cause stress? Do you feel pressure to be the perfect this and the perfect that? Um, and then if, if you can understand how our society sort of sets people up for stress, then you would understand why Mr. Muller says India provides a corrective. So, um, Okay, let's do a round of that. Do you think, Colin, that our society sets you up for stress? Um, it does. It just depends on when for most people. So personally, elementary really wasn't stressful. Middle school really wasn't stressful. High school... It was my junior year that was stressful for me and going to senior then I started getting it more consistently but I kind of think like stress levels and the idea of stress is based on your time management too I think that can help out a lot so I think they're like it does set you up to get it but I think there's also ways that you can like manage it and deal with it Poverty is pretty hard. Though. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. that isn't a matter of time management, uh, especially if you have to have two or three jobs. But um, so there's all these different things, you know, the, the underclass in the US or the underclass anywhere, right? Poverty, disease. Um, but in addition to the normal stressors, does our society set you up for it because of how it defines success? I don't know. Open question. What do you think, Michael? Oh, go ahead, Tim. Fine. I think it does um, set you up for stress because, like, for example, now, like, electronics has got so advanced, and now people are, like, always checking their phones, seeing what's new, and comparing themselves. And I think like comparing yourself is really the root of evil. Can we compare yourself to other people? You get jealous, you get more stressed out trying to be better than them. You should just stay in your own lane and do your own thing. Definitely. And Hinduism and Buddhism definitely is trying to teach you that. Does that make sense, Tim? Yes. Good. Um, anybody else? Uh, I'll go. Uh, no, you go ahead. Um, I was just going to talk off of what Tim said, like, like with social media and just like um, phones in general, like uh, in a lot of the psychology classes I've been in, like the bystander effect is one of the things that comes to mind, um, which basically it's just like if somebody is like out on the street, like getting like beat up or someone has just got shot and like there's a bunch of people standing around, 
like now i think with like i think i primarily think it's because of how technology is now but like you just expect somebody else to do something about it and then no one does anything about it because you're all thinking that someone else is doing something about it um which can obviously that that doesn't really have to do with like long-term stress but like the the idea that technology has kind of taken away our uh I don't know. I don't relationships I don't. to other people. I mean, right. But I mean, it can lead to, you know, it can lead to death or serious harm of someone else as well. Um, but to speak on like uh, just generally stress, um, yeah, I think that like you, you talked about poverty, but also like race. Like there are people who are afraid to get in their car and drive down the street and get pulled over because they could die because of their race you know like that is a that is obviously a stressor um for people um but then uh as far as like college goes like i think college is one of the most stressful times of a lot of people's lives and it's like recognized like that like professors recognize that but we still stay in the same kind of educational system like there's been a lot of research done on like um how like splitting of classes, taking less classes per semester, for example, um, but having shorter semesters is actually much more beneficial for like remembering things, like actually learning. Um, so I think, yeah. Go ahead, Alexis. I do have to agree with it, Michael, with the beginning of what you said, just how like, sorry, you were staring at me, um, how he said that like, social media is the cause of like all these like this issues because you immediately assume that someone else is going to do it I don't think it's that I think it's the train and like how we're trained in our mindset we're immediately trained that once there's a leader then we follow and not really a lot of people are trained to be leaders and I think that's why because when I see something on social media I'm the first one to report it block it to uh type how that's uh, like type and correct them and I, and I see that all the time. I see how people are constantly correcting, possibly like, hey, you might not know. Like, I see that on social media all the time. I don't think it's social media's fault. I think it's society and how we're taught. Because a lot of the time, as a Black female, a lot of the time, I'm afraid to speak up. I get verbally abused a lot in Arkansas. And I'm afraid that if I speak out and go to a white cop and be like, such and such happened, guys, such and such, something's going to happen to me and not them. So that's where I disagree. Zane? Uh, I kind of lost my train of thought, to be honest with you. I'm sorry. That's okay. You and Michael were kind of raised your hand at the same time, but I don't. Uh, yeah, I think I agreed a lot with what Michael said. I was kind of lost what I was going to talk about. Okay. Ryan, did you raise your hand? Okay. Um, we were talking about stress. Um, I don't know. I'm just gonna so I'm just gonna use like a real world real world example like such as this summer like this summer I'm taking nine credits and with a time difference I have a class at 4 a.m every day and then this class at two and she's like really I mean I guess yeah society pushes us to be stressed the way it's set up but at the same time it's also the stress we put on ourselves because like right now like for example I am backed up on the last paper and this paper, uh, the daily journals, but I'm like totally back. I didn't even start that essay to be completely honest. It's been like marinating in my head, but I just haven't had the time to sit down and do it because it's like my last week with my family and I'm not gonna see them till Christmas. So I'm choosing to put the stress on myself, I guess you could say, cause like I could choose to like not see my grandparents, but then get the essay done but I'm choosing to see my grandparents because he's like 87 so or 78. So like I'm choosing to put that stress on myself knowing that that's a consequence. So like I will have to one day stay up really late or whatever, like whatever it may be. But I think that the same thing goes with like, like what Colin was saying about stress management and like time management. It's like what you do with your time. And then also like that's the same thing for society. Like if you're gonna value money and you're gonna value those things, and you're going to put your self-worth into it, then you're going to be stressed about it. And okay. so um, I just think that it's the same thing. Yeah. And, you know, with the failure of the minimum wage to go up for 30 years, 
um, people having to work two jobs. And I mean, we talked about that before, but even among people who have lots more opportunity, like when I see my students and they're on sports teams that demand 30 hours a week, and then they're supposed to go to school, which is 40 hours a week. And then some of them, I mean, I don't know how they do it, right? But the system is sort of set up. So it, it isn't set up so that you have a day of rest. Like it's always been in the past. And that's a psychological need to have a day to step back, right? All those old traditions. Um, yeah, right. Um, I better move on though, Ryan, but in I, when I make the next point, you can be the first one. Um, what do you really want in life? How much do you ask yourself? I asked myself this a lot during the years when I had a ton to do. Like, what do you want? How did you get here? What choice did you make? Did you make a mistake? Is this really what you want? Um, so path of pleasure, success, renunciation. I mean, for me, I wanted to get a PhD in philosophy because there's no other degree or career that fit what's going on inside of my head. But even the philosophers, 90% of them, that's not what's going on in their head either, which is really bad, but you still had to satisfy them. And so then it was, well, what do I want? Blah, blah. But anyway, so you have to figure that out, uh, the path of duty. And then do you really want to stay, to make sure that positive karma, like you don't get overrun? <laughs> um, do you step back at some time or do you just step on the gas harder until you can get what you want? Um, and then the paths to God. But, and I think we talked about that more energy or the path of love where you personify God or there's incarnations, they account for these other religions. Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad are all incarnations of the Brahman, the path of work. How many of you really, it's what you do. That's the physical work is how you get in touch with your inner world or just exercises yoga and the four stages in life and the four stations in life so um so the last round will be what do you really want have you asked yourself that and how to get it um i guess we'll start with colin I am so sorry, but my uh, internet was lagging. All I heard was my name and nothing okay, else. That's fine. So we're just asking, what do you really want? Have you gone through that question? And I'll ask Alexis first. And there's these four paths, pleasure. Most of you are not on the path of pleasure. You wouldn't have gotten into lying college. Um, success, duty, or to stay in touch with the jiva, just to live a harmonious life. Um, Alexis? I truly think that I'm on the path of like a harmony life. I want to live a life where I feel safe, I'm happy, and I don't have to stress as much, which is what I plan on doing for the rest of my life. I'm 100% at Lyon College for pleasure. It's weird. I know I'm the only one. I'm here. I'm at Lyon College to play soccer. That's the only reason I'm at Lyon College. So I think okay. I plan on like living my life and the path I set myself out on is to enjoy my life, not to take it too hard. I am like, I live by the motto, work hard, play harder. I'm not going to stress too much about it. I'm going to enjoy my life because like we said, life on earth is limited. Okay. Jordan, are you there? Maybe not. Uh... Yeah, I, I'm here, but uh, I have to change because I have something to do at uh, nine at eight thirty, right when we leave. So okay, okay, Zane. Um, yeah, I mean, I have thought about this quite a bit actually. Um, it sounds cliche, but like a big 
thing I want out of my life is I want to help people. I always have been. Like, I'm, I don't know, whenever I help people, I mean, it just makes me feel better about myself. And so if I can, you know, impact somebody's life in a positive way, I mean, that's that's worth living for me. And also just a, another thing that I focus is trying to live in the moment, which is something I've kind of struggled with in the past. So just kind of do that. That's a big thing that I want out of my life. So I can kind of look back and just say, yeah, I live in the moment there. So, yeah, that's pretty much it. Okay, good. Um, a lot of people feel a lot more satisfied when what they do is helping people. If you can believe it or not, that's why I went into philosophy. It isn't very many people who think their philosophy teacher helped them more than anybody else, but that was my case. <laughs> uh, Jordan, you got something? Um, I think I said this earlier, but like what I want out of life is to help as many people as I can and grow as a person. I don't okay. want to be the type of person to like say that's enough learning. I've like learned enough. I just want to always be challenging my perspective on things and understanding it from a different point of view. Very good. Our society needs you. Uh, Tim? What I would want out of myself is like to really just like all right, like to like elevate basically get my um, get rich you know what i'm saying and like like just know my work basically not trying to like especially when i get older i don't ever want to go on the social media and like just just look for something i'd rather just go on there just to just to see something instead of like lurking for like something to do comment on watch a video or something like that so just like to be focused on a plan to get money in Really just stick to that plan. Don't let nobody or no outside forces like stop me on the way of like being successful, basically. Okay. I don't I don't want to like attempt to be successful and keep having pit stops with people who are invading it. That's good. Um, Michael. Um, I would say I somewhat agree with Jordan. I think like a lot of life is uh, like a, a continuous like learning. Um, and then I think like a lot of issues and and that are created are because of people's refusal to continue to learn. Um, refusal to what? To continue to learn. Okay. Like with the world, like learn with the world as it changes. I think that like there are substantial issues that we've talked about in this class um, having to do with a mindset that doesn't ever um grow um so yeah i don't know uh who else colin you ready yes um i kind of like the idea of success like i'll start there and i'll figure out where to go after but i want to get to the point where I don't have to rely on anyone else and live completely like well. Like I don't want to just survive. I want to do well for myself. So I kind of want to get there. And once I'm there, I'll figure out what to do then. Okay. And Ryan. I mean, it's kind of a loaded question. I mean, I guess the easiest thing is just like happiness, but that also entails success that it also talks about my spirituality and then it also it's like a balance of everything like I think I here's the thing like I need to work hard to get the money that I need to travel and have the experiences that I feel like I need to have a rich life like a, a beautiful life having connections with other people bye okay. so yeah I mean interconnected Okay. But I want to be happy. Yeah. Okay. And then, so for next time, and I'll do the video in a, an hour or so, um, we're going to do Gandhi. And there's an essay about Gandhi. Let's see. There's a story of his life that I'll just talk about on the video. And then there's an essay by Thomas Merton. And then there's, um, oh, the Gita. So I will, these are sections of the Bhagavad Gita. Now, I think I had you buy it. 
So um, hopefully you can find those page numbers and look that up. And then this is scholarship, the idea of the holy. This guy is looking at patterns between the different religions. And here's disagreements about 9-11, how you interpret 9-11. Um, and these are the different um, historical figures, these icons of virtue. But um, yeah, I think, I think each of you needs to come up with a woman <laughs> or another African-American. I mean, I did one, Martin Luther King or a, a queer person, a non-binary person who's a hero, Harvey Milk, um, or somebody from some other ethnicity, because, you know, the ideas, you know, these are the starters. But what we're going to find out is every one of these religions is also sexist, and it's all got flaws. So on the first day or days, I look at the positive side and then I start looking at the negative side. So I don't want you to think I'm trying to, I, I want you to buy into it as much as you can, just expand your imagination. And then you have to see how any of these traditions can be corrupted. Um, all right, so I'll let you go and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye guys. Oh, so what did you think of my uh, essay? I you... liked it a lot. Did okay, I did... You saw one yeah. comment? I didn't know if like it was like what you wanted from the essay or oh, what. Oh, sorry. So I didn't comment that much on the content. Uh, sorry, no, I totally agree with that. I know. <laughs> so do you think Socrates? He's just a archetype. Like people should carry him around in their head. You know. He represents critical thinking. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Also, I sent in the same time I sent in my uh, last week's um, comments and class things. Oh, I don't know if you got it because I was having issues with my Wi-Fi. I don't think I got it because I thought I read everything. Um, let me check. I'll check right now unless you have to go. Um, let's see. Oops, uh, classwork. Let me see. The issue I had with that is that I had to restart it because I didn't have my like class yeah. comments anymore. That's okay. But that's you know, okay, regardless Jordan. of that, I just want to make sure. Let's see which one. This post number two or post number three? Number two. Post number two. Okay, so and three. I I was supposed to have three, but so but you haven't had it in three yet. No, I put in three. Okay, well. Okay, so Jordan, I don't have anything under two. No. So that's, I mean, you can write on it that you handed it in on time or that you have an excuse. I mean, not going to grade it down. It's just trying to figure out yeah, how to get it. I, with my paper, I, I wrote it at a library and turned it in at the library. I'm sorry. <laughs> because, like, like my Wi Fi at home wasn't working. And then I tried to turn my other thing in on my Wi-Fi and it was just like, no, you can't do that. So I was just like, cool. cool. Okay, so this one, is this yours? No, I think it's Zane's. Oh, okay. Um, I don't think it turned either of them for me. So I'm gonna go see if it saved because I put it in my word. Well, it's funny because it's, Okay, do you see what I mean? I it says yeah. Jordan Young here, and then when I click it, it's Zane. That's, That's what I, I'm not sure if I've turned mine in and then it just like you can't see it, or if I haven't turned it in, like it doesn't like come in. I don't know, but like I I don't know. I was really flattered that you liked my my oh, essay so much. I'm sorry, I didn't write more comments on it. No. I just felt like somebody gets it. I'm telling you, Jordan, like I got that totally when I first read it. And I've there are a really small percentage of Americans probably understand this, the rule of law, you know, and that you have skin in the game. I mean, you don't have a democracy unless everybody kind of gets that.
I feel like I was, I kept reiterating the same points, but I felt like I kept stating it at a different time, but I did it like okay enough where it wasn't like the same thing said over and over again. Because I know what you mean. That was like everyone kept saying that he was gonna get out of it, but he's not going to because he knows that it would make him a hypocrite. And he wanted to emphasize the rule of law and how that law is like immoral because it causes people who don't have enough money to face crimes that they don't deserve. And well, the rich get off. Yeah, exactly. He didn't want to be a hypocrite. And that was his main belief that he can. That's why I put that point in there, which I thought that you wouldn't like, but it was like, you have to practice what you preach. You have to do what, like, you're claiming all these things. It's an unjust system. It doesn't like account for this, but you're not doing anything about it. So they just were like, oh yeah, he's another person who's just talking out his ass. It's just going to do whatever, but he actually commits to it. And that's why he had to die.